Before we begin, a message for uh, Applied Series subscribers. We have two live sessions today. First one is at noon to 1.30. Next one is 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. The times are meant to get uh, uh, to appeal to different time zones. Um, so, um, two sessions, uh, left menu, Applied Series Q&A. It'll drop down where you see Schedule and Live Version. Uh, when you get close to noon, click on Live Version and you'll be in the right place. Looking at rates week over week, we can see the one month has uh, corrected itself from last week, up 99 basis points this week. Lots of volatility in that one, isn't there? 4.25 or 4.35. Still probably about 80 basis points lower than where it should be, considering we're going to be looking at a target range of 5 uh, to 5.25 after uh, Wednesday's central bank meeting. I don't see a pause. I do see a rate increase, and we'll look at some inflation numbers and employment cost numbers uh, coming up. The uh, two-month is right in that range. Same with the three-month and the four-month sitting in that range. All the capital market rates have pulled back again this week, which strikes me as rather odd. So you got to think these things through. Uh, price increases uh, for wages uh, and for PCE and, and uh, also those associated with Q1 GDP came in higher than expected. So the idea that there's a, a rate cut uh, coming up is not a possibility. The only condition under which you're going to get a rate cut is if something significant really breaks. Uh, and I think that's what's going on with capital market rates is there is a belief that given that, uh, the money market rates have got to push higher. And if they're pushing higher, that is a cost of funding for a lot of floating rate debt. And it's the cost of funding uh, for banks. You've got a much deeper inversion going on. And with a much deeper inversion, you have a much more uh, fragile credit system. So something is going to break. And I think capital market rates are reflecting that something is going to break. However, the equity market seems to be uh, playing its own game on the other side of the wall and not even paying attention to this. Uh, the inversion. We're kind of a little more than two more months will be one year inverted in capital market rates, the two to the 10. And the three month to the 10 year is inverted 166, hit a record for this cycle, that is, of 173 on April 16th. The uh, three month rate, at least using so for 18 months forward minus a current three month, inverted 206 basis points versus 184 last week. Nothing much to see on the balance sheet. It's down uh, almost $30 billion. The SOMA runoff was $17.2 billion, pretty much all MBS except just a small amount in CMBS, down to $7.74 trillion. That continues on. Looking at money market funds, remember last week we saw a decrease in money market funds? Well, we're back to an increase. Um, the decrease we saw last week is pretty typical uh, for tax day week. So being that uh, taxes were due, you had withdrawals from money market funds, probably to meet uh, the uh, taxes that were due. We're back to increases, another $54 billion, up to $5.26 trillion. Retail up $5 billion. Institutional up uh, almost $49 billion. FOMC meeting, three days. Happens on Wednesday at 2 press conference at 2.30. Don't get too excited at 2 o'clock. Whatever market action you have, the real show is the uh, is the press conference. The uh, probability of 25 basis points, I would have think, should have increased to almost 100% certainty. Uh, but it went from 89% and actually dropped down to 84%. So I'm not sure what everybody was looking at. Because based on the data that I saw, you had corporate earnings, which seemed to be doing okay. You had a market, which seemed to be going up. Uh, and you have a strong consumer. When we looked at GDP, everything seems to be fine. There is, there is no reason to pause. There is no reason to cut. And the employment cost index and the PCE came in above expectations. I don't know why 100% wasn't cemented in for the 25, but what is going on that there is some uh, movement or some money that is betting that no, it's not quite that, that the Fed's actually going to hold. 
11% up to 16%. And for June, um, 5% uh, went from 11%, uh, sorry, from 8% now to 11% that there'll be nothing in May and nothing in June. Uh, one rate hike, 62.2%, probably reflecting just the May with a zero in June and 225s, May and June, to get to 550 went from 23% to 26.8%. So this seems like a logical step to take, but this seems like a rather odd step to take. Um, the effective federal funds rate, 4.83 next week. That'll be 25 basis points higher. Reverse repo up 35 billion for the week. This is from April 25th. I saw this headline, I had to read it. New York Fed limits types of firms that can access its reverse repo facility. So I thought, oh, well, there we go. I mean, they have to pay out uh, four, at 4.8%. 4 they're paying this out uh, at uh, the overnight rate uh, and probably getting tired of it saying, okay, we, we've got to try to limit this. We've got to try to push this back under $2 trillion and try to get it down. Uh, but uh, this is uh, from the narration of the story, money market funds that in the sole judgment of the New York Fed are organized for a single beneficial owner or exhibit sufficient similarities to a fund so organized, generally will be deemed ineligible to access reverse repo operations. So what they're saying is that if you've set up uh, a fund specifically to access the reverse repo because it has a higher rate, you will be disallowed. That your accessing of the reverse repo should be a natural course of the business that you do and not be the business that you do. Uh, and um, maybe we'll see it show up next week. Maybe, you know, I don't know that they would say something like this unless they saw that it was being used for something like this. I mean, I mean, why have a story that says I'm not allowing creatures from other worlds to enter my house unless you've had a problem with creatures from other worlds entering your house? If not, then it doesn't need to be said. So they must have had observed some kind of issue there to say that. And maybe it'll show up uh, next week. Let's look at the ECI uh, report uh, Friday. This is in five days. The FOMC is not going to have the benefit of this. But Canada and the U.S., uh, we have a jobs report. Uh, Fed uh, already has the ECI in the books. We got this on Friday. Look what happened here. Q1 23 ticked up from Q4 2022. So we had a couple of quarters of down movement and then it ticked up. Wages and salaries up 5%, benefits up 4.5%. This is quarter over quarter annualized. Uh, and overall, the combination of the two based on their weighting up 4.8% annualized. If we look at what it was for the quarter, Q1 23 uh, for uh, the total ECI came in at 1.2 for the quarter. This is where you get 4.8% annualized. And uh, here is uh, 2022, Q1 to Q4, and here is 2021. And we're at 1.2. If you look back over 2022, 1, 4, 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, that does not look like a problem that's going away. It looks like a problem that's going sideways. Going into 2021, it was 0 0.9, 0 0.7, 1 1.2, 1 1.1, and it pretty much has just stayed there. And 1.2. I don't know that the Fed is believes that its job is done because wages are sticky. Uh, also, what we saw during the month of March, we'll see it when we get to the housing section, is uh, housing prices are up. They're actually rebounding in Canada. They've actually increased after uh, several months of decreasing or a period of time of decreasing. They're now increasing again. And the belief is that with so many people having taken out mortgages uh, in 2019, 2020, 2021 at really, really low rates. Now that rates are very, very high, you're facing the, uh, the prospect of, well, if I sell my home, I only have to buy a new one. And if I have to get a new mortgage, I'm just going to be paying the higher rate. So a lot of supply is just not even hitting the house, uh, sorry, hitting the market. Uh, and Canada is just bringing people in the country. Now, there are no houses. So housing prices are going back up. Uh, immigration levels are starting to climb again in the U.S. 
and maybe that's what we're seeing there is housing prices start to increase if you look at the ECI and you dig into ECI a little bit uh, we get down to wages goods producing industries up 1.5 services producing industries up 1.2 benefits here up 0.7 benefits here up 1.2 and you look in goods producing industries construction uh, is the highest construction uh, wages in the construction uh, sector and if you have uh, you know if you look at the home builders and the earnings that they've reported out of the you know out of the ballpark you have them hitting 52 week highs as a group uh, I'll point out which ones hit 52 week highs on Friday but you're printing 52 week highs uh, and wages are going up uh, in that sector I just don't think you have the employment necessary to build the houses at the speed you need uh, because uh, existing houses just aren't hitting the market I don't think employment cost is done I think that uh, as I've said before given the elevated cost of housing uh, it, wages have a long way to go to catch up with where housing can suddenly be affordable again to the average income earner it's I don't know how somebody even making a uh, hundred thousand a year is buying uh, is buying uh, a home when uh, existing home prices are five, six, seven times that level, at least in Canada, if you're in the Toronto area, you're making a hundred thousand. You're not buying a house, not on a single income. You're not buying. If you're in Vancouver, you're not buying a house. So I think wages got a, a long way to go. Okay, real yields, break-even rates, not much to see here. Small little movements. This is another oddity. Break-even rates actually. Uh, dropping and I guess if you think it through I mean if, if break-even rates increased you could make the case that well of course the cost indexes came in higher than expected uh, break-even rates decreased so using the same argument you could say well they came in higher than expected the belief is the Fed will raise rates even more which will then crush the economy and crush inflation so when given data depending on what argument you can make you can sort of make two uh, uh, make both sides of it so you know there's just just this maximum uncertainty uh, where you could you know interpret them both ways and interpreting it the second way you're giving a lot of uh, credit to the market that they're playing two three moves ahead but being that the moves are rather small I, I don't know that there's much to see uh, in that one Fed funds rate uh, not much move uh, week over week here uh, last week, uh, July, uh, was bottoming out at 94.89 for a rate of 5.11. Same with this week, 94.89 for a rate of 5.11. December was 95.33 for 4.67. We're now 95.375 for 5.625. Uh, drop of four and a half basis points. So I said that this curve would have to flatten out over time. If the economy stays where it is, if earnings uh, companies keep uh, earnings uh, where they are, if unemployment stays where it is, there's no cutting. There's no cutting. That curve's going to have to flatten. Well, it's coming down little by little. Uh, and going out to March 95.77 for 4.23. Last week was 4.305. Looking into 2024, December 23 to December 20. Four using one month so far. Uh, three uh, by December 2024 versus 4.58 at December 23. 158 basis points. Last week was one that I've got all the weeks before 134, prior to that 132, 134, 130, negative 97, negative 78. So that is getting even deeper. Uh, so the only interpretation I can give on this, given the price data, given the, the, the anemic GDP we had, yes, the consumer uh, did most of the heavy lifting there, but the consumer always does the heavy lifting. Uh, but given uh, the elevated price indexes and the anemic growth, uh, the, the, what's, what we're seeing with a negative 158 basis points is a Fed cutting because something is going to break as opposed to oh well everything is going to be fine there's no reason for for these levels and the fed is going to cut this this to me seems like they're pricing in something significant breaking tlt up 1.43 percent for the week spy up 0.95 
Uh, all still no implied volatility here. I've made no changes on my TLT position at all. I was going to buy some 105 calls uh, for next March if TLT had given me any weakness in the week, uh, but it opened Monday uh, without any weakness. It never gave me the opportunity to buy at, uh, I think at the best price I saw was 775 or 785. I'd like to get them you know, mid sixes. I was really hoping for sub 103 on, uh, on on TLT, but as you can see here, this is 104.50 over here. Never, never got below 104.50. If I gotten a 103.50, I think I might have gotten gotten them for sub seven dollars, maybe high sixes, but wasn't going to give me a chance. Implied volatility ending the week 15.6. SPY's implied volatility ending even lower than TLT gives you an idea of the volatility that is sitting in treasuries when uh, treasury volatility is higher <laughs> on an implied basis, is higher uh, than equity volatility. OAS, some credit spreads here. Basically nothing to see. Uh, even Triple C is saying, eh, there's nothing to see here. So the spreads on Triple C uh, decreased a bit. The uh, high grade one to three investment grade bonds, 5.24 US, one, the one year treasury at 4.8. So there's 44 basis points in excess return uh, for the one to three year bucket. The two years at 404 for 124 uh, basis extra return. And uh, the three years at 375 for 149. If you wait, if you wait these, just do a, you know, an equal weighted average. Uh, it's 106 basis points premium by being in the high grade one to three. Now this high grade could be a mix of all of these. It's just an index that tracks investment grade as a whole. It's not as if it's any one particular, um, one particular grade. You could say, well, compare it with a double A because that's where the government is, double A, 4.61 versus 5.24. But this double A could, could be anywhere from one year all the way out to 30 years. So, uh, you know, sort of this is uh, the kind of cleanest way to do it here. This uh, is from the Senior Loan uh, Officer Opinion Survey from Q4 2022. The next one is May 8th, uh, so it is worth looking ahead. This is where we left last time. This is commercial industrial loans, uh, and you have commercial real estate, and these green bars here uh, signify recession. And this is the net percentage of banks tightening lending standards. And this is before we uh, saw First Republic, Silicon Valley, Signature Bank, all of that. Uh, you know, this is in the 40 to 60 percent range over here. There's 40 percent. There's 60 percent. The percentage of banks tightening lending standards that was already going on. So it is going to be very interesting to see what uh, what this is going to hold. And we don't get it this coming week. We'll get it the following Monday uh, on the 8th. But uh, this will be interesting to see how much higher these go. I can't see that it would, it would drop. Given that they were already tightening credit standards, this happens. It's not as if everybody says, whew, great, we can lower our credit standards now. Thank God that happened. I just don't see that happening. I think it continues uh, to tighten. Uh, and, you know, when you look at uh, before recessions, credit tightens always before recessions, right? Now, this one tightened after because this sort of just came out of nowhere. That's a pandemic. You can't say, well, you know, uh, we anticipated it. No one can anticipate an exogenous event like that. But after it happened, there's the reaction to it. But before every recession, credit standards uh, tighten. And we have that going on here. And I think it continues on. So this is going to be rather interesting to see. Okay, mortgages and housing. Some interesting stuff going on here. In fact, I think super interesting stuff going on here. Mortgage, 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage, 6.43%. This is as of the Thursday, uh, which is up four basis points for the week. The Thursday over Thursday, 10-year was down one basis point. So the spread between uh, the 10-year treasury and the 30-year fixed has increased by five basis points. Agency, down 1.39% for the week. Net interest in dollar roll income because they uh, had earnings 70 cents. The estimate was 61. They beat on that. The tangible book value per share is 941, and they're trading above the 941. A little bit of a higher level of leverage 
Uh, then annually over here, 7.7 .7 times leverage, which probably contributed to their uh, lower uh, book value per share. Leverage is great when things are working out for you, but just as bad when things are not working out for you. Uh, I continue to uh, hold agency and I will continue to add on weakness. Right now I'm, I'm uh, probably wouldn't add until I see it under its book value per share under 941. Uh, I've got a lot of shares now. I'm comfortable with it. I'll add more. Annually, I have shares and I've sold puts uh, on these up 3.72 for the week, 81 cents a share uh, in terms of uh, uh, their uh, net income and dollar total. Uh, tangible book value per share, 2077. They're trading just under their tangible book value per share, which explains their increase. Lower level of leverage, 6.4x. Uh, when the Fed starts lowering rates, when the economy falls apart, both of these companies will take a hit. Uh, both of them will sell off. But as those rates start coming down, uh, that's when you're going to, if you're not, if you're on the sidelines on both uh, Annaly and Agency, that's when you want to really load up. Wait for the hit down because of, of something breaking. And if it's, especially if it's credit related, they will take a hit. And that's when you want to step in. Uh, if you are interested in getting in there. ABR up 10% week over week. Uh, May 5th, they'll be reporting earnings before the bell. It's always the first Friday of the uh, second month of earnings, April being the first month. That they tend to have this pattern of being the first Friday before the open. Uh, so May 5th, uh, they'll be announcing. It'll be interesting to see if they continue uh, their, uh, their pattern of increasing their dividend. They've uh, been increasing it, uh, I don't know how many times now, by about a penny or two pennies each time. I think they may want to send a message to the short seller, so I think they're going to do what they can to deliver a whole bunch and punish any short sellers at this point, but up 10% week over week. Let's look, before we get to the housing, because I want to spend some time here, uh, housing price index uh, for uh, the month, month over month, for Fe this is for February, uh, 0.5. Uh, Case Shiller up 0.2, uh, which is up 0.4% year over year. New home sales for March up 9.6%. That is new home sales, not existing home sales, new, which benefits the home builders. The estimate was 1.1%. I want to just think about that for a minute. The estimate was 1.1, came in at 9.6. February, you had price increases as well, and March. I know uh, just uh, based on um, uh, the Canadian data that, that I've seen, and if you look at Realtor.com and, and, some, uh, and some of the other sites like Zillow, uh, showing that the home price has increased month over month in March. We're not going to get that data uh, from Case Schiller and the uh, HPI. Uh, for a while. Mortgage apps ending April 21st, coming in again, positive 3.7%. Both the refi and the purchase index are up. Pending home sales for March, and this is year over year, down 23.2, but I don't think that's surprising on a year over year. The previous year over year was negative 21.1. don't know that there's much information in pending home sales year over year at this point. Let's look at the home builders again. Look at this DHI up 2.96% after printing some 52 week highs. Uh, Lennar up 1.63%. Pulte up 7.7% for the week, hitting a 52 week high on Friday. KB Homes up 5.18% for the week, hitting a 52 week high on Friday. Toll Brothers up 3.67%. Bazer Homes also hitting a 52 week high. Havnanian up 3.57%. XHB up 2.29%. This stuff is not giving me any chance to get back in. And I think even if we have a, a recession, given the shortage we have in housing at this point in time, I don't know that housing is going to give me much of an opportunity to get in. So I'm simply not going to wait anymore. I'm going to start my allocation factories. And if you've been through the applied series in the options, the applied options, uh, I explain what an allocation factory is. So I'm going to uh, do it with uh, 25 uh, to 30 deltas. Some of them I can only do monthly. Some I can do bi-weekly. So DHI and Lennar uh, would have uh, weekly, whereas something like uh, KB Homes, sorry, KB Homes only offers me monthly. XHB has weekly uh, expirations, 
uh, but has very low implied volatility compared to some of the names. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use bi-weeklies and I'm going to add each week so that I have rolling uh, two-week periods. Every week I have these rolling two-week periods and I'll do it on a number of names. So for example, DHI for the May 12th expiration, uh, a delta that's sitting between the 25 and the 30 deltas, the 107 put gives me 105 to 120. So if it is put to me, uh, you know, a little under $106 per share. And I will um, probably sell it out two weeks. Then next week I'll sell another two weeks. So I'll have two series going at the same time and I will hold them right till expiration because my, uh, my, uh, hope is that I will have some allocation, that some will be put to me, but I can't wait uh, for a pullback at this point. They keep hitting 52-week highs, and I don't see the fundamental drivers that are supporting their prices disappearing anytime soon. Uh, if the economy remains uh, resilient, these rates are going to stay where they are for a fairly long time. So you're not going to have a bunch of supply hitting the market from existing, uh, existing homeowners. If the economy falls apart significantly, credit's going to tighten up. You're not going to have a lot of excitement in terms of trying to sell your house uh, at that point in time. So I don't see supply hitting the market for quite some time. So I am simply just going to start. I've uh, given it time. I've waited. I've sold puts judiciously here and there on pullbacks. I've never really gotten the prices that I wanted or never really gotten the premiums I want. And I'll be honest with you, there's no premium in these either. They're all implied volatility at 0%. They're all as low as they can be. And uh, if you understand what allocation factories are, is that you have some kind of target amount that you want to hit and you keep selling puts and when things get put to you if your allocation starts getting too high that's when you can start selling calls and puts at the same time that's when it starts to get profitable because you don't mind some of them being called away from you because your allocation may be getting too high uh, so i will begin that uh, this week coming up in fact i probably will wait for the fed i'll see what the market reaction is there and then i'm simply just going to begin uh, uh, begin on five or six of these names. Okay, let's dig into GDP a little bit. Came in at 1.1%. Um, uh, all of these numbers I'm getting from table two in the GDP report, 1.1%. And we know GDP is made up of the components of C plus I plus G plus, at the very bottom of the screen here, X plus M. And uh, table two gives us the contribution to the 1.1% from each of the four. So 2.48 minus 2.34 plus 0.81 plus 0.11 gets us to 1.1. So let's look at the consumer, 2.48, breaking down the goods and services, both of them positive, 1.45, 1.03. Goods, durable goods and non-durable goods, 1.32 and 1.3. Uh, nothing to dislike from the consumer. Uh, business, fixed investment. Well, this is logical. Negative 2.34. When rates increase, this always takes a hit. Fixed investment, negative 0.07. Kind of flat. Non-residential up 0.1, or at least the contribution, I should say, not up, but the contribution of the 1.1 is uh, 0.1. Residential, negative 0.17. Basically, uh, when you have this you know, negative 0.07 as a contribution, basically flat. This is the effect of higher rates. It hits that sector first, and this sector or this category of GDP is the most volatile. Look at inventory, negative 2.26. That is uh, working off of uh, inventory over the quarter, uh, selling from inventory, which uh, will help explain some of the low manufacturing PMIs is uh, why should we make stuff when we can uh, sell it from inventory. When interest rates are as high as they are uh, in money market rates, inventory, holding inventory has a definite cost because it's part of your working capital requirements. Well, you have to fund your working capital. And typically, uh, if you're funding working capital, you're funding it with short-term financing. You're not using long-term financing to fund your working capital. You try to match the uh, length of the liability with the length of the asset. Um, well, rates are extremely high, so holding inventory and carrying inventory has a very real cost. Not only that, inventory is deflationary. Uh, the higher the levels of inventory you have, the more you have to clear them out, 
Remember Walmart? Remember Target that had too much inventory and started uh, selling aggressively, uh, lowering their price on, on those products to move that inventory out? Well, inventory is deflationary. We've already seen GM decide to shut down a truck plant for three weeks rather than make trucks for inventory. Why would you want that? Now you got to move them and inventory is expensive to carry when money market rates are sitting at 5%. Uh, so if you've got to carry, you know, $10 million more of inventory over the course of the year, well, multiply that by 5% and that's what you're giving up. Your working capital is going to cost you a significant amount. If you carry lower levels of inventory, your working capital costs are lower and it supports a higher price because you're not uh, you're not uh, carrying inventory that you have to clear out or that you have to move out. So I don't know that that trend reverses itself with interest rates so high. There is an absolute cost to carrying inventory in two ways. Number one is, well, your opportunity cost is 5%. Number two is, it is disinflationary or deflationary and most companies probably would like to keep these higher prices. You know, when we think about inflation coming down, we think, well, supply will correct and, and uh, inflation will come down over time. Uh, about a month ago, I made the point of saying, let's not underestimate uh, the desire of participants in the market to not have inflation come down. Uh, Employees don't want their wages to come back to a 3 or 3.5% year-over-year increase. They want the 5 and 6 and 7%. They don't want it to come back down. They want more. Uh, car companies that have gotten used to full margins don't want to give them up again. They don't want to have to put out dealer pricing incentives uh, and, and employee pricing incentives uh, every fall to move inventory. Uh, they don't want to do any of that stuff. So you have a lot of market participants, uh, not financial market participants, but, but real market participants, I think, that have a vested interest in not seeing prices come down. The home builders don't want to see prices come down because, well, that's going to squeeze margins. If you think about it, no producer, no seller wants to see their margins hurt, so they want the, the ability to continue to raise prices, and no employee wants to go back to 3.5% wage increases when they've gotten used to 5, 6, and 7. So I think this inventory thing is, is going to be probably a sticking point in the sticky inflation argument. Let's look at uh, G.81, uh, federal and local, uh, 0.49 and 0.32, and from the federal defense and non-defense, almost even. I wonder, uh, the debt ceiling, uh, are we going to see a Q2 effect? Uh, and if we do, it most likely would be negative because at some point, if we don't get some resolution, you're going to have to start shutting down some services. Well, if you shut down some services, that's governments not giving some people some money. So government spending would drop. So Q2, I think you can expect a, a drop here. Interest rates are going higher. I don't see how this category of investment is going to increase with higher interest rates. And like I say, inventory, I think, uh, is going to continue to be uh, not, not a contributor to GDP, maybe not a, a detractor to this extent, but I don't know that companies will be too aggressive building a lot of inventories in what they believe would be an eventual recession of the Fed continues to hike rates. And again, the higher rates go, the more expensive it becomes to carry this inventory. So I would expect to continue to see PMIs in contraction under 50. As far as, uh, well, let's look at X minus M here, 0.11, almost nothing here. You have uh, exports and imports uh, sort of offsetting each other, 0.11, small contribution uh, towards GDP. Let's head over to the consumer. Uh, what do we got? Listen, uh, you know, 2.48, you might say, ah, they're very resilient. It's very rare that you'd get a consumer uh, that is going to cause a recession just because the consumer gives up. Consumer-led recessions really aren't a thing. It's usually from somewhere else, and then it hits the consumer with higher unemployment, and those that have jobs do pull back as well, and that's where you start to get the consumer falling off. Something else breaks first. Uh, you got low unemployment. You got a whole bunch of people who have a job. You have elevated wages and benefits. We saw that from the ECI. You have elevated quits rates. 
Uh, if we go to the Atlanta Fed and look at what job switchers are getting, this is for the month of uh, March, by the way. Right? This is for the month. ECI was for Q1, January, February, March. This is just March. Uh, so we saw um, wages accelerate in March, actually. Job switchers up 7.3% in February. It was only 6.7. Job stayers was 5.8 in February, now 5.9. This is March data. So you got elevated quit rates because, hey, I can make the big jump to 7.3. We see that in the JOLTS report. Low unemployment, elevated wages and benefits, elevated quit rates, very high marginal propensity to consume, especially the lower seven, seven deciles. That means uh, the lower 70% basically have a marginal propensity to consume of about 100% of their disposable personal income. Um, that uh, is after, when I say disposable personal income, that's after forced savings. Uh, the bottom 70% really don't participate uh, in a savings rate. While they do have a savings rate, that's because of deductions from their paycheck, forced savings that go into Social Security or go into some kind of uh, um, um, pension plan that their employer uh, either has that's matching for them or is part of their pay but it comes off of their pay before it hits hits their pocket. So there is forced savings, but whatever is left over, you got a propensity to consume of almost 100%. Uh, and if you give them more, they'll spend more. So it is not surprising that the consumer uh, has, uh, has a huge contribution towards GDP because they always do. That bottom 70% of income earners they do spend every single penny they make. And if you give them more pennies, they will spend more of it. They head right to the mall and they start spending. Uh, so unless you break uh, employment, uh, you're not going to break that part of GDP. That's not what's going to take it down. Uh, if anything, it is going to come from either investment, a lack of investment, um, or more likely uh, something in credit, which really causes uh, huge drops in fixed investment because a lot of this requires debt. A lot of that requires debt to get done, especially on the residential side uh, for fixed investment on the non-residential side as well. Uh, so really, that's pretty much where you would have to look. I wouldn't look to the consumer and look for fatigue in the consumer because if you're giving the consumer money, that's all you need to know. Are we giving them more money? Are new jobs being created? So on May 5th, uh, we get the jobs report. If you see 200,000 jobs being created and everybody making more money per hour, the consumer is going to spend it. Q2 GDP, the contribution from the consumer is not in doubt. It won't be in question. It will be I and it will be G. Okay, let's look at the price indexes uh, for GDP uh, for Q1. And this is uh, indexes for gross domestic product and related measures percent change from the preceding period from the preceding quarter. Uh, let's go to the PCE, personal consumption expenditure, 4.2%. Breaking down on the goods, 0.7%. And services, 5.9%. 5.9%. Uh, and we've already seen labor, the ECI came in 4.8%. If we look at Atlanta Fed, uh, just uh, looking at their wage tracker for all categories, December, January, and February, each month came in at 6.1. It was basically going sideways. It had elevated. It was coming down. It was going sideways. And March, 6.4, heading right back up. Um, initial jobless claims, uh, week ending April 8th, 240. The next week, 246. Next week, 230. Uh, next Thursday, we get another one. If it's sitting around the 220, 230, Friday's jobs report is going to print a positive number. Uh, so there'll be more people who are heading to the malls. So the consumer uh, is, when we say the consumer is okay, that's kind of a misleading statement to make. That's saying the consumer is healthy. No, the consumer is actually sick with a virus and it's called, it's just called the consumption virus. And uh, especially uh, in North America, there is uh, uh, this, this culture of consumption that if you get money, money is meant to be spent. You got to buy stuff or you buy experiences. Uh, and speaking of buying experiences, if, if you look at uh, what stocks are hitting 52 week highs uh, on Friday, Yum Brands, McDonald's, restaurant brands, uh, um, Lamb Weston, 
which is a frozen goods, uh, uh, um, um, primarily frozen goods, the stuff you find in the frozen goods aisle, convenience shopping. Uh, that is all hitting 52-week uh, highs as well. A lot of spending on services. If you look in the services sector, looking for where the largest uh, wage increases is, if you look in the ECI, retail services uh, are big. Nursing, really big there as well. PCE, this uh, we got on Friday for March. The core PCE was 0.3 month over month or 4.6 year over year. Uh, let's go back to February, January, December, November. Look at November, 4.8. December, 4.6. January, 4.7. February, 4.7. March, 4.6. That is the definition of sticky. That is basically going sideways. Take this 5.9, which is primarily driven by labor, uh, the services side, 4.8. Given what is going on uh, with the Atlanta Fed showing that March actually uh, showed an increase. The ECI actually showed an increase. The, uh, the, um, the PCE uh, index in GDP, uh, what we see down here, uh, PCE excluding food and energy, 4.9. Let's see if I can get a better color there. Line 34. Why am I not writing on that? Line 34. 4.9 and market-based PCE excluding for, for food and energy 4.9 look at the month before uh, uh, sorry the quarter before Q4 was 4.1 increased to 4.9 in the first quarter from the third quarter of last year if you look at the first quarter of this year the PCE excluding food and energy 4.9 look at uh, the last quarter 4.4 the quarter before that 4.7 4.7 you got to go back to uh, Q1 of 2022 you get to 5.6 this is the highest it's been in the last uh, four quarters this Fed is not going to not raise rates 25 is basically in the books for Wednesday why the market decided that there was a lower probability although small still lower it's very puzzling to me and that uh, the idea that um, they're one and done I don't know so much because you are seeing uh, a reacceleration of wage inflation a reacceleration of PCE we saw uh, housing prices increase in March and if we look at the rent index it has shown a small increase in March as well uh, and this is what the Fed warned about, is saying that these prices will come down, especially they were talking about the good side. It is going to come down, but it is going to bounce. We're going to see some reflation going on in the goods sector, although they didn't see that in housing. It is starting to show up in housing. High rates are keeping inventory off the market, which is boosting uh, the average price of houses that are being sold, because that's all you can see when you, when you do a housing price index is, well, what's sold? The only thing, the, the, the new homes are selling uh, uh, quite well, and we're seeing from the home builders that they're doing very well. Where in all of this do you see no rate hike in May and we're done, or one rate hike and we're done? Where do you see that, given the language the Fed has used over the last year that they will not be deterred, that there will be some pain, that they are solely focused on getting it back to 2%. Uh, where, where do we see that they're going to stop in May uh, and, and hold? I think the senior loan officer opinion survey will have a lot to say. And if we don't see that credit, sta that the credit standards have tightened any more significantly than from Q4 2022, you can count on another 25 in June, I think. Okay, let's look at our forward four-quarter earnings. Our friend Mr. Silverblatt is back from vacation and the spreadsheet is updated. Forward four quarters, 223.28. Keep in mind we're now using Q2 of 23 to Q1 of 24. Uh, the last update we had was 224.40. <clears throat> so down a dollar twelve. Closing SPX 41.69, which puts it at 18.67 times forward earnings. Uh, inverse of the PE 5.36, 10 years 3.44. So you're, if you're using the 10 year for your equity risk premium, 192 basis points from what should be maybe four or 450. 
Uh, six month yield 5.06 so you got about 30 basis points uh, in there from the six month to the one year in terms of the yield that you're getting not the return but the yield based on on where earnings are implied volatility is gone just absolutely gone look at the 200 day, the sorry the 20 day straddle is 2.59 percent of the price last week it was 3.03 .03. Uh, we had some, some IVP last week, and it is just gone. IV last was 13.1%. There is no fear in this equity market at all. There is no fear. Either that or uh, it's broken. Either that or this measure is broken. And I made uh, the argument that perhaps zero data expiration options are pulling away volume uh, from the uh, period of time which would have uh, be the measure of implied volatility and if there's no volume there there's no extra buying there because it's all concentrated where the VIX doesn't measure well then you can't be driving put prices up because of higher volume <clears throat> so I find uh, that to be a rather interesting state of affairs that you know I think with maximum uncertainty there should be some trepidation and there is none. I mean, it's the lowest it's been in 52 weeks at 0%. 2.59 on a 20 day straddle, 13.1%. Um, last week, uh, the market started dropping, uh, which was really nice. So I started selling the 4170 puts. I think my average price was just a little over 100 by the time I was done. I covered Friday in the 66 to 74 uh, range. In fact, the 66s I got after the market closed, I think a little after 4 o'clock. And I started selling the 4170 calls. My average price there is 126, <clears throat> but I haven't sold that many of them yet. I just started selling them as the uh, market, uh, you can see at the very far end here, we just kind of went up almost 110 points in two days uh, so on friday i started selling the 170 calls uh, again average of 126 while i was covering the 4170 puts so i'm out of the 4170 puts and i did very very well on an aggregate basis there 16.6 um, if we look at an equilibrium forward multiple if we were uh, had a market in equilibrium um, 370645 uh, would be uh, the uh, multiple uh, at 223.28. If we have a year end target, this is the price today. If we want a year end target, there's 245 days left in the year of 365. We're looking just for a price target. So we'd normally um, use the long term return on the SP uh, on the S&P of 11 percent, but 1.8 percent of that is a dividend. So 9.2 on the price uh, times uh, the 3706 would be a year-end target of 39.35. If we want a 12-month target, we're just increasing it at 9.2%. We get to 407.4. We're sitting at 41.69. Uh, so some good 230 points higher uh, than what an equilibrium price would be. Uh, and roughly about 120 points higher than what an end-of-year price would be. Now, what we do with that is we don't say, well, the equilibrium is fair value. Equilibrium may not be fair value. But what we ask is, uh, does the conditions today justify a valuation above an equilibrium multiple? Uh, so if we think, well, rates are uh, coming down, uh, unemployment is high but dropping, and uh, earnings estimates are increasing, yes, that does justify a higher multiple than equilibrium. Uh, but if rates are high and probably going higher, uh, if earnings estimates are coming down, if credit is tightening, that is not an above average uh, multiple. Uh, you can't suggest that we are somewhere above e an equilibrium pricing at that point. We're somewhere below an equilibrium pricing at that point. The market seems to have it backwards. But I'll tell you, uh, the market seems to have a whole lot of things backwards. Uh, just uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. I am uh, going to continue uh, my short position. I'm not adding uh, uh, much to my short position. I mean, I've added some 4170 calls, but I'm getting 126 on them. I'm using the June 
options expiration with the September contract as the underlying. Uh, so there's double carry in that because you have the carry from where the September contract is and then you have the 126 above that. So it uh, gives me some nice premium. Um, I do expect some weakness. Otherwise, I wouldn't be short. Whether the market agrees with me or not, I don't know. Uh, to add to my long beta position, as the market was selling off, I was closing my puts. I also sold puts on BHP, on Rio, on FCX, on Alcoa, XME, and Oxy. And uh, next week, I will start selling puts on the home builder. So as the market recovered on uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, all of these recovered nicely for me. Uh, so while my short position was giving money back, uh, my short puts on these uh, were sort of offsetting that uh, as well. I will uh, continue uh, on these ones because I do want to allocate uh, a significant amount to uh, mining companies and to home builders. And uh, I think it is time probably to start looking at uh, where uh, the next uh, round of investment is going to come from because I, I still need to get from roughly 50% investment because uh, I'm allocating to home builders, I'm allocating to mortgage, re mortgage REITs uh, and to metals and mining, roughly about 50% of my portfolio. The other 50% is going to be factor-based and I think the best factor there is going to be momentum. So I think it is time to start looking for momentum because those companies that are outperforming under these conditions will be companies uh, that outperform, uh, I think, on the next cycle. So it's just a matter of, you know, finding which sectors are doing well. But starting next week, we'll start seeing how we can uh, identify momentum and where momentum is showing up and at least starting to put them on our watch list to see if they're clustering in any particular sector or any particular industry or sub-industry. Let's have a look at the... Uh, calendar ahead, although I don't think anything matters uh, other than uh, the Wednesday and the Friday. Wednesday is the Fed, and then we have Friday with the jobs report. Uh, and we'll look at the earnings calendar because it is another thick week. And then after this week, it, it lightens up. All right, going into the top of the week, Europe is closed, May Day. So they are closed Monday, ISM Manufacturing. Uh, for the U.S., the forecast is 46.7, still under 50, still in contraction. I expect that uh, to hold. This will be an interesting one, construction spending. Uh, that typically falls under business fixed investment. But we're also seeing uh, that uh, wages, if you look at the ECI, the category uh, where wages are increasing the most, construction is one of them. So that'll be an interesting uh, one to see there. Uh, factory orders at uh, May 2nd at 10 o'clock, forecast for 1.3. There are uh, There is some thinking that, well, if you had such a big inventory drawdown in Q1, wouldn't you have some inventory building, which uh, could be quite possible. But keep in mind, if you're running a business, uh, you know where uh, rates are. You know that inventory costs money to carry. There is an opportunity cost, even if you have the cash. You could be parking that in a marketable security. If you don't have the cash and you're using a bank line of credit to finance your inventory, well, what are the costs of, of carrying uh, excessive inventory? Especially if you think that you're heading into a slowdown, right? So that'll be interesting uh, on that one. Jolts <clears throat> at 10 o'clock. This is for March. You have uh, the openings and the quits. We'll see if the quits rate is still sitting over 4 million total vehicle sales. That'll be interesting as well. Uh, and then uh, ISM services on Wednesday. I don't think anyone's really waiting for that to happen, but we're going to get it. 51.8 is the expectation. Uh, this is the big show over here. 2 o'clock is the interest rate decision. 2.30 is the uh, press conference. Uh, going into Thursday, we have continuing jobless claims again. Uh, this will be the last number uh, we, uh, we, we get to see before we get our uh, employment report on Friday. Both Canada and the U.S. Uh, average hourly earnings. Uh, it's a messy number, but it still gets looked at. The forecast is for 4.2. Uh, 
Average weekly hours, 34.4. Anything dropping below that uh, does start to affect what the consumer can do. Because keep in mind, we're, we're not in doubt that the consumer will spend money. We're not in doubt about that at all. What we are in doubt of is how much money will the consumer get to spend. Once they get it in their hands, they will spend it. So it's really just an amount of what is the aggregate income that the consumer receives, not what is the willingness of the consumer uh, to spend. See if that participation rate continues uh, to inch its way up, sitting last time at 62.6. Uh, 62 and consumer credit change late in the day on Friday. Following Monday is the senior loan uh, opinion, uh, senior loan officer opinion survey. Let's look at earnings. So I've uh, just taken uh, the list uh, as opposed to having them in order of the dates, <clears throat> put them in an, a, a new sheet, and then I just uh, organized it based on sector. So it's all broken down by sector. So three from communication services, and then you have a bunch from consumer discretionary. Uh, three from automotive, Borg Warner. I used to follow that. Uh, I don't really anymore. Ford, I do have shares of Ford. We'll see how uh, they do. GM had good earnings. Uh, and in uh, pre-market, they were up considerably, and then just sold off during uh, uh, their press con uh, their uh, sorry their uh, earnings call, uh, and then continued uh, to stay under pressure for the rest of the week. But I'm going to continue to hold GM. Uh, I think they can find their way back up into the low 40s. They're at low 30s. I'll continue to hold them. Uh, what else do you have in consumer discretionary? Yum Brands hit a 52-week high on Friday. Uh, so a lot is being priced into Yum! Brands. There's Starbucks as well. Uh, restaurants just seem to be on fire. McDonald's, a 52-week high as well. You have some consumer staples in here. Uh, a lot of energy companies. A lot of financials, but not banks. They're in the different sectors uh, in finance. you got some life and health, multi-line insurance, property and casualty, transaction and payment services. Uh, a lot in healthcare, which it's a sector I don't really follow that much, but... Uh, just, you know, just the sheer amount of companies that are reporting in that sector. Uh, CVS, from what I understand, is, uh, uh, um, you know, a fairly good, uh, good stock at a low, at a very low valuation. Uh, might be worth looking into that one a little bit more. Uh, lot in industrials. Uh, what else do we have? Information tech, but none of the really big names. We had all the big names in this past week, but you've got information technology uh, down here. You've got some materials, real estate. Uh, you've got some REITs, uh, retail REITs. It'd be interesting to see how, uh, how they do. Uh, do we have any uh, office REITs? Uh, no, uh, self-storage REITs. Self-storage, I think it's just a license to print money. They do fairly well. Electric utilities, uh, gas utility, and then uh, multi-utilities. Uh, and uh, what does that give us? Uh, 157. 157. Uh, I think I started at row one. I started at row one. Uh, so Tuesday after the close, Ford. That'll be probably the one that I'll watch the most because I do have shares. Uh, I do have shares of Ford. And that's it.